Hi, welcome once again on my scientific channel, Discover Social Sciences. In this video, I am introducing uh, the basic theory of markets. So this video is addressed mostly to the uh, first year undergraduate students who have like the regular course and subject of microeconomics with me or with any other teacher, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, it can be considered as a revision material for those students who are more advanced in all kinds of managerial uh, majors and just want to revise uh, the basics of the theory of markets. So anyway, it is in that path of teaching which I call or which I label, especially on my YouTube channel, as the fundamentals of economics. So, we go into the theory of markets. Uh, I will use a PowerPoint presentation, which you can see here in that window. Uh, first, a few words of uh, introduction before I go into that PowerPoint. When I, uh, when I do economics and when I teach economics, I try to go into like the very fundamental stuff. I I tend to go and I uh, willingly and gladly go into the behavioral fundamentals uh, of what you can find in textbooks in economics. So my point is that the best strictly educational way to use this video, to use this content, is to use it when you have access to some kind of paper or online textbook uh, in microeconomics. It is always good to have that formal theory at hand, within reach, uh, so as to confront all that stuff that I am serving uh, in this video with what you can find in, let's say, more structured theoretical development. So. I go into the theory of market approached very behaviorally. First of all, a few cases just to give you the idea of how I approach markets. The first very basic market, one of the most basic ones, the market of food. And there is a question. You can see people starting new food stores, essentially when a new neighborhood forms, for example, when a quasi-rural suburb of a city turns into an urban structure, sooner or later someone opens a food store. Why would they do it? So what is the, the logic behind starting a food store? Now. We start a food store because we know uh, there is a recurrent, predictable demand for those foodstuffs, for the, for the, for the food that we want to sell. Huh? And as we think of it, it is not as obvious as one could think, because there are many goods where demand is much less predictable. For example, if you have the choice between opening a food store and opening, for example, a dealership for luxury cars like Porsche, you would intuitively say, OK, in this neighborhood, food has like more certain uh, market, more certain uh, demand that I can fulfill, that I can meet with, with the food I sell in my store whilst those Porsche cars, maybe they will sell here, maybe they will not. That's tricky. Mm -hmm. So why would anyone start a new business in the form of a food store? Because he or she knows there is a market for food with predictable prices, predictable quantities and predictable patterns of behavior in customers and wholesale suppliers. In this case, the market of food is a social structure I say it is a structure because it is very repetitive and it is based on a network of exchange. That network coordinates the development of distribution systems. When someone starts a food store in, uh, in my neighborhood, 
wholesalers and distributors of food will sooner or later reach out to them and propose them to create like a permanent distribution channel. So the market of food gives people in cities access to food made, uh, made elsewhere. The market here is a structure of coordination between people, which allows the emergence of very complex networks of distribution. If you wanted to design in advance, uh, to design in the mode of central planning, such a system of uh, food distribution, it would be bloody hard. But the market does all that planning and organizing for you. Case number two, the market of consumer electronics. Question, why would anyone invest money in developing a new computer, a new smartphone or new smart glasses? So why would anyone undertake to innovate in the domain of consumer electronics? Answer, there is a market for electronic goods and that market allows, first of all, packaging a radically new technology or an improved one into standardized economic goods, into standardized marketable products. Second of all, that market allows predicting future sales and profit margins uh, that we can derive from marketing those goods. The market is a structure, a recurrent structure, and we, if we observe that structure at work for a sufficiently long time, we can predict prices, quantities, and we can predict profits that we can derive from marketing those electronics. So, consequently, we can predict the return on investment. So, in this case, uh, the market, in the case of consumer electronics, is like a collective fortune teller. Imagine that you go to a fortune teller at a fair, uh, that lady with the vaguely gypsy look spreads her tarot cards in front of you and she tells you your future. You ask her, will I be successful in launching those new electronic devices? And she says, okay, here is the death card, you certainly will. But instead of going and see her, you can observe the market of electronics and from the observation of the market you can derive a reasonable strategy for launching that new technology you want to launch. So in this case, the market allows coordinating a very complex effort like innovation because it just gives empirical material for predicting prices and quantities. Now another type of market, the market of constructed real estate. The picture that you can see in the, in the screen here uh, happens to be a picture of residential uh, real estate, so houses, but it can be any type of constructed real estate. And now question, maybe apparently a stupid one. Why do we commonly live and work in, building, in buildings made by someone else? Why hasn't our culture conserved that habit of building with our own hands whatever structure we want to dwell in. After all, someone could say building the place where I want to stay or work is like an elementary survival skill. Yes, it is. But the market of constructed real estate has a peculiar trait. It requires uh, accumulating a large amount of resources in one place. So it requires a large amount of money, uh, a very large team of people who are supposed to build whatever we want to build. It requires a lot of equipment, of machinery. So it is like heavyweight coordination. And if you are successful in the market of constructed real estate, so if you are a successful promoter, you can just rock it up in the social hierarchy. So the market of constructed real estate makes construction an attractive business, which means that it is an acceptably good way to build a strong position in the social hierarchy without using force. It is attractive. Climbing like to the top of the heap without having to kill anyone. 
I know it sounds drastical, but if you go like 500, 500 years back in history, you can see that it is not as obvious as one could think. Eh? Back in the day, if you wanted to be like someone in the society, you needed weapons and you needed deadly force to impose your will and to impose your position. So in the choice between everyone building their own house on the one hand and having construction as a business on the other hand, the latter wins because the market of real estate has those multiple social roles, making money, making social position, uh, creating a non-violent hierarchy and so on. So the market of constructed real estate, we can say that it tacitly coordinates the utilization of, habitab of, of habitable space. Excuse me. Now a little bit of uh, like a bottom line commentary uh, after those three cases. First of all, markets are a form of tacit coordination between humans by the means of repeated exchange of goods and services. Now a little a little stop and a little digression by the concept of tacit coordination. What does it mean tacit coordination? When you think how you want to coordinate with other people. For example, if you want to perform a, or, or to achieve a big project in any field. When you ask yourself how you can coordinate with other people for and in that project, the spontaneous answer that emerges, I have to convince them. I have to build a team. I have to convince those people to jump into the game. We need to develop some kind of mutual trust. Yet, if instead of that, we create a market which can facilitate that project, that market works as a device for coordination. We call it tacit because in markets people coordinate with each other without even knowing they coordinate. They just align their behavior on the, on the behavior of other people. They adapt and that creates co uh, coordination or tacit coordination. So there is a recurrent pattern in the way that markets work. If I engage actively into a given type of exchange, for example, if I undertake to supply a given type of goods and services, then I can build a social role and a position in the social hierarchy without violence. I can develop new technologies, so essentially I can be an inventor whilst keep earning my living. Other people can do the same in connection with my activity and we can all organize even without being friends with each other. Sounds simplistic, but this is how markets work. They serve to coordinate human action. And the markets in our civilization have brought that concept of competition. So a very dynamic, quickly happening rivalry, which happens without violence and coercion. So markets allow playing games for social position instead of fighting. And as you think of it, it is a good way of using limited resources in a society. When we fight, we devote a bloody big amount of resources just to fighting. And fight, if you think about it, usually in a fight you need to overshoot in order to win. If you want to be sure that you are going to win a fight, you need to put in the fight a lot more resources that is strictly than what is strictly necessary. If you have uh, like a peaceful structure for competition, so if you can play a game without fighting or instead of fighting, you can very precisely scale your resources according to the situation. You can afford to like wait for the next move from your social partners or from your competitors. If people whom you are in rivalry with become players in a game instead of being your enemies in a fight or in a war, it dramatically changes the use of resources. 
And the markets have that strange property of creating predictability in behavior without requiring trust. It might seem once again a little bit cruel, but if you think, how long does it take to develop enough trust to engage together in like a big team into a complex project? And if you compare it with how quickly you can develop a project through market-based schemes, the latter are much faster. If you find a market for your project, you can build business deals. On the base of those business deals, you can build a business structure and it goes much faster than convincing people that it is just good to trust each other and to work together. Markets are made of recurrent transactions. This is what creates predictability, re recurrence. Re recurrence is important. Transactional patterns, which we form by collective learning, allow coordination between individuals. So we coordinate by being able to predict each other's actions. And we don't need to trust each other or we don't even need to know each other, like really. We can coordinate just on the base of those recurrent transactional patterns. And we know by experience that in uh, markets, prices, quantities and contracts are the like three big pillars of predictability. And the microeconomic theory of markets largely focuses on studying these three types of phenomena. So I am going to, to go quickly through those three. So through contracts, through prices and quantities. If you think, if you have any experience in business or maybe just based on your experience in life, if you think about the essential types of contracts or deals you can enter into uh, when you like do your daily activity, when you earn your living, I suppose you can intuitively distinguish, just as I can distinguish those two basic categories. There are some deals, some contracts, where I can feel and I have like evidence, demonstrable evidence, that I am more or less equal to the other party in the deal. I have like real power in negotiations. I can see that I can influence the way those deals go. In economics, it has been discovered that those like uh, equality-based contracts or equivalence-based contracts are uh, associated with, common, uh, with competitive markets. So with markets which are very quick in response to new facts and new situations, markets which are very fluid in, this, in their structures, and markets which, revor, uh, which reward like uh, lean adaptability and lean agility rather than size and power. So these are markets where you really have to be quick on the update and figure out things quickly. On the other hand, there are deals, there are contracts, uh, which are much more like, uh, much more as asymmetrical. So contracts where uh, I can feel that either I strongly dominate the other party, my business partner, or I am strongly dominated by them. But there is that visible, like almost tangible asymmetry. Either I dictate the rules of the game or the other party dictates the rules of the game to me, but there is no more such uh, equality or equivalence in market position. And those asymmetric contracts based on domination, they are commonly associated with imperfectly competitive markets or with those completely non-competitive ones. Now, a few words about those two types. So, about competitive markets versus non-competitive markets. In competitive markets, 
so in those based on uh, those equivalent uh, equal food type contracts there is that phenomenon that we can call outbidding in a competitive market you can see that people try especially suppliers of goods and services try to outbid each other either directly in terms of price or in terms of price and quality or in terms of service added to the goods that they are marketing there is that phenomenon of like race for the satisfaction of the customer and uh, that in turn leads on the long run to a phenomenon of mutual alignment of business patterns in competitive markets people tend to align their behavior on each other they tend to be very similar in their behavior uh, and one of those similarities is the price it is a fact which we still barely understand that in competitive markets where there is no clear domination in deals and contracts prices tend to like align on each other through mutual outbidding they tend to align on each other and to form like a central band of prices which is called in the theory of economics the equilibrium price if you care to have a look at that picture uh, on the slide it is like that classical uh, model of market equilibrium so the point where those two curves or, or, or two lines cross so where demand crosses supply we have that equilibrium point with the equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity and uh, why that equilibrium quantity too because it is another finding another observation that you can make about competitive markets in competitive markets people do not really hold big inventories of whatever they could hold as inventory the manufactured goods or the finished goods are quickly sold there are just as much inventories as is needed to like keep a smooth stream of supplies and uh, uh, there is that idea that whatever we keep in inventory we want to minimize that in, in inventory as competition disappears from a market inventories tend to to climb and the equilibrium price in a competitive market can change rapidly uh, under the influence of changes in consumers behavior in suppliers technologies so this is that component of fluidity and finally a few words in non-competitive markets like the opposite end as compared to the comp to the competitive ones essentially prices and quantities in non-competitive markets are much more stationary so in other words whenever you have a competitive market so whenever whenever you have a market with those equal food contracts with quickly a market which rewards quick adaptation and like lean agility in that market prices and quantities can change quickly in a non-competitive market they tend to be much more pegged to a certain value to a certain level uh, it is like a common sense real life observation that when one party to a contract is a clearly dominating one then people have a strong incentive to conserve that dominant position and even to to develop it to strengthen that domination and one of the ways you can do it in a market environment is by deriving high profit margins predictably high profit margins either from selling at a very high price or by buying at a very low price and accordingly to those two types of like abnormal profits that you can derive from domination in a certain type of business deals we can have either a monopoly or a monopsony a monopoly is a situation when you have like one exclusive supplier of some category of goods 
and they build their domination on the fact of being an exclusive supplier and they tend to further develop into conserving that exclusivity. On the other hand, when you have, for example, a market like uh, military equipment being bought by governments, when you have a big government, a big government which buys a lot of weaponry, they can essentially make like the annual revenue of a company with a single order. Uh, for example, I observed the, the relationship between uh, the order that our Polish government intends to place or has al al already placed for those Patriot rockets manufactured by the American company Raytheon. And I discovered that our single order, the single order from the Polish government, makes practically the annual revenue of Raytheon in the field of rocket systems. So this is a, an example of a structure based or, or a structure when domination is based on being an exclusive buyer and being an exclusive buyer is called a monopsony or a monopsonic type of market, a monopsonic type of deal. Now, both types of domination, both type of non-competitive market so both the market based on monopoly and on monopsony, they share a common denominator. They always, uh, they are always based on exclusive or privileged access of some social entities to the key resources of the community, usually to capital. So if somebody in the in the social game has exclusive or privileged access to large amounts of capital, then we have that high likelihood of seeing those market structures, non-competitive market structures, based on dominance in business deals. Okay, this was like a short theoretical introduction to the theory of markets. I will continue in this path in subsequent videos. Now I let you digest those basic facts. And um, as it is um, typically educational content, I strongly encourage you to take those theories that I have just served you and sort of try to scan your social environment with those distinctions. Look for deals where you feel that either you or someone else is really at equality, at equal foot with the other party in the contract. Try to see how those types of businesses play out. Try to see the types of deals where you have clear dominance. So try to like map your social environment according to the distinctions from that video. Okay, that would be all for, for today in this video. As usually, I wish you to have fun with your life and to have fun with science. Bye.